The fallacy of equivocation is committed when what is true for one definition of a term is assumed to apply to another definition of that term. The textbook example is Premise 1. All feathers are light. Premise 2. Things that are light are not dark. Conclusion. Therefore, no feather is dark. The problem is that light in premise 1 refers to weight, not color. It is true that something that is light in color is not dark, so it is assumed that the same is true for things that are light in weight. What is true for one definition of light is assumed to be true for another definition of light as well. One of the arguments most frequently used by Christian apologetics is the Kalam cosmological argument. Premise 1. Everything that begins to exist has a cause for its existence. Premise 2. The universe began to exist. Conclusion. Therefore, the universe has a cause for its existence. Further reasoning supposedly shows that this cause is Yahweh. Premise 1 is supported by intuition and inductive reasoning. To save time, let's say I grant that we have tons of experience with things that begin to exist because of some cause and no experience with things that begin to exist without any cause. However, whenever something begins to exist because of some cause, a system transitions from one state to another. In state 1 we have a pile of wood, for example, and in state 2 we have a table. A table has begun to exist, but has done so ex materia, out of pre-existing material. If the universe, which includes time itself, began to exist, then it did so out of nothing at all, ex nihilo, because by definition there cannot be such a thing as a state prior to the beginning of time. These are two different meanings of begin to exist, so the conclusion does not follow. If we write out what we really mean in the premises, we see that the fallacy committed is actually a non sequitur. And that's what an equivocation is. A non sequitur in disguise. I have previously mentioned how possibly possible, as in not known to be impossible, does not really mean possible, and use this to refute the modal ontological argument. The defense against this is to state that premise 1, just like the rest of the argument, uses the S5 axioms of modal logic, one of which is that possibly possible implies possible. That's true, but only using the definitions of modal logic, and not known to be impossible is not the definition of possible in modal logic. Using this defense only leads to an equivocation fallacy, because if we grant premise 1, we are definitely not using the definitions of modal logic, which the rest of the argument relies on. A word of warning, an equivocation is when you change the definition of a term during an argument. That's a fallacy. To use a different definition when responding to an argument than the one used in the argument is not an equivocation, but it is a fallacy, specifically a straw man. However, it is not a fallacy to redefine a term as long as the new definition is provided and used consistently. A definition is nothing more than a declaration that in this context this term will be used to refer to this concept. When assessing an argument that uses a redefined term, what matters is the new definition, not the commonly accepted one. That's not what that word really means will never work as a refutation of an argument that holds up given the definition used by the speaker. It's both a red herring and a false statement because words never really mean anything. A word means whatever the speaker wants it to mean. Don't bother opening a dictionary. Dictionaries merely report on how words are commonly used. They are not authorities that must be obeyed, and even if they were, that's irrelevant since the argument stands or falls regardless of whether this authority is obeyed or not. While it's often safe to assume that dictionary definitions are used, if they're not, well, they're not. As long as the definition that is used is provided and used consistently, that's not a problem. When talking about miracles, Winston Wu explicitly refuses to define what a miracle is, since, quote, any average English-speaking person knows what it is." Unquote. The problem with this is that the word has more than one meaning, even within colloquial English. Miracle can be synonymous with magic, that is, the manipulation of the natural world by divine or otherwise supernatural means, such as Jesus turning water into wine and returning from the dead. But it can also mean unlikely fortunate event, as in, it's a miracle that I won the lottery just when the bank was about to take my house. Wu says, quote, Possible explanations of miracles include supernatural forces, divine intervention, psychic abilities, unknown powers and healing abilities of the mind, 
spontaneous remission of illness, chance, or natural cause is not yet understood. Whatever the case, the miracles are impossible argument is illogical because miracles have happened already." Unquote. Note how he lumps divine intervention and unknown natural causes together and then says that miracles have happened. Yes, I agree, events produced by unknown natural causes have happened. For example, once the cause of lightning was unknown. Note that he says, whatever the case, suggesting that he really does mean that miracles by the magic definition are possible simply because miracles by the unlikely fortunate event definition, like spontaneous remission or chance, are possible. Until next time, stay logical.